men only want sex. Men only want sex. And I'm just like, that's so not true for so many men. It's true for a lot of men. I'm not going to say that it's rooted in nothing. How you internally react to this statement is going to be very indicative of where you are in your journey. And it'll be great because you'll figure out like where you need to, to start. If there's a girl I want, I'm like, I want you. It's not from a place of need. There's a difference between I need you and I want you. I want you. I see the amazing woman you are. Welcome to the Face Your Freedom Show, where we talk all about creating a life of freedom, walking your own path, and pursuing your purpose. My name is Alan Howard. And I'm James Weston. We are two entrepreneurs best known for taking a leap off the beaten path and pursuing a life of freedom and self-discovery. Let's get into it. Welcome, guys, to the Face Your Freedom Show. We are here for part two with our good friend Brittany Martinson, and we are looking forward to today back by popular demand. Uh, As always, I'm here with my co-host, James Weston. There we go. (laughs) And myself, Alan Howard, and our guest, Brittany Martinson. James, you want to tell the audience a little bit about her, maybe a little recap? Absolutely. So guys, we got some incredible feedback on the last episode. We're super excited to have Brittany back. But if you didn't catch the first episode, um, quick synopsis of why we have Brittany on the show, why she's such an interesting guest is really she has gone through a lot in her life from living on the streets when she was in high school to losing her virginity in a gang rape um, and really found a way to make sense of all that and really show up every day as a person that just transmits a ton of love into this world. And (laughs) so that's really why we wanted to have her on the show is there's just a ton to learn from her. It's a ton to learn from her experiences. And uh, we really want to dig a little bit deeper today. We want to hear a little bit more about your story. We want to hear a little bit more about your journey to becoming the person that you are today. So let's just jump right into it. Yeah. Yeah. And and not only hear your story, I think get some more knowledge from your brain to the rest of the audience and to us as well. I think there's a lot for us to to learn too. So um, you want to you want to kick it off? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big things that came up after the first episode and some of the feedback that we got from or that I got basically from people that had watched it was people were really curious about how you've taken the trauma and the things that happened when you were younger, such as the way that you lost your virginity. I know you don't like to call it that, but um, <laughs> your sexual debut. Your se- yeah, you. the way that your sexual <laughs> debut happened. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people who are listening that have different types of trauma in their life, different things that they can kind of relate, maybe not to that extreme. And they're wondering, how do I make sense of that? And then how do I take that and not allow it to affect my relationships moving forward in a romantic way? Um, so how do you kind of approach your romantic relationships? How does that change for you? That is, that is such a big question and I'm so happy people are asking it because actually one of my favorite methods for growth is closeness in relationships. I think that close relationships are probably among the number top ways to heal the, it's nature's organic remedy to trauma Mm, and often it's not seen that way it seems relationships are tough and they're a cornerstone of our life and they just do not have to be Uh, relationships can be springboards into higher levels of consciousness they can be a path to full evolution and the way to get there is to recognize this moment that happens inside of a relationship they usually start off very Uh, passionate or like romantic and there's a lot of energy there's a lot of um, excitement at the beginning of a relationship and then something happens where you get close to someone and your shadows emerge so you have two people that are in a relationship together standing in this harsh bright light of love and light casts a shadow and so then those two people have their shadows that they've been desperately trying to keep hidden and don't want this other person to probably even see. And so when you can recognize that moment, there's one or one of two things that can happen. One, you can use it as a catalyst for personal growth, or you can become partners in each other's dramas. And mm-hmm. this is the pivotal point of codependency or co-commitment. Uh, other way to explain it would be conscious loving versus unconscious loving 
Can I can I ask something real quick? Yeah. When when you when you say the moment for them to bring out their shadow, just to clarify for myself and also part for the audience, is that where the moment that you see the real ugly truth of people, the sides they've been trying to keep hidden, is that is that kind of what you you mean by shadow? Yeah, I I do mean that. It's showing you your trauma and where you need to grow. And that's mm. what I mean by it's nature's way to heal trauma. Mm. It's showing you the parts of yourself that are that are coming out because our traumas I'm going to break a myth here. Yep. People are like time heals all wounds. Time does heal doesn't heal anything. <laughs> you heal something. <laughs> and love that. And so like if you have something that you've been harboring for a long time, then you it just becomes a part of your unconscious patterns and it's ruling your life. Your unconscious mm. mind is powerful. Your conscious mind is efficient. And so your unconscious mind is ruling your life, is ruling your patterns. And so inside of there is your traumas and how you're reacting to things. And in the day to day, you can have complete control over it and probably never see it, but it is in the light of love and close relationships that that can really emerge yep. and people blame usually a lack of love for their problems in relationship but it's almost the exact opposite it's a resistance to love that's causing that conflict and so once you're is that like fear of being vulnerable fear yeah. of like showing the true self is that... yeah so okay. it's usually shows up as like you're you're withholding you're withdrawing and we can get into a little bit of like how that appears in most relationships these are our unconscious deals we make with our partners in order to not heal. So if we want to be in a relationship with someone, but we're not willing to be vulnerable or to heal, we make a deal. So I'll be like, all right, Alan, we're going to be in a relationship. And look at that smile. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we're in a relationship. <laughs> and, and then it's, if we're not willing to use our relationship uh, as personal growth, yeah. then we would be like, all right, I'm not going to make you change any of your disruptive patterns if you don't make me change any of mine. Or mm. you can project your childhood trauma onto me if I can project my childhood trauma onto you. Yeah. And the ways that these show I've up. I've been in that. Yeah. Haven't we all? <laughs> That's why this is going to ring so true. Yeah. There's, oh, you're going to, I mean, probably recognize a few of these. Some of them might not relate to you. But in that deal making, there's four major ways that this shows up. One is blame. And so if you've seen a relationship where one person's always the good guy, one person's the bad guy, that relationship is being sustained in that blame game. As mm. soon as someone takes off that bad boy hat or bad guy hat, the relationship's over. Another way blame shows up is uh, united in blame against something external. And we're both so in hatred to our parents for ruining us. So we're united in blame there. Another way blame shows up is through victimhood. Mm. The moment I step out of full relationship with you and become an advocate of my victimhood, there's no room for intimacy there. And the fourth way that blame shows up is in, what is it? Must oh, be projection. Good. Oh, there we go. It's projection. <laughs> <laughs> it's when you aren't willing to take accountability for your life. And so if I'm like, oh, you made me mad, you can't make me anything. I have anger inside of me and I'm pointing it at you. Yeah. That's the way blame shows up. Another one, which is pretty common, is power struggles. So these are types of relationships where someone is like always trying to figure out who's to blame or who is mm. wrong or who is right, who has the power to end the relationship. These are people that are addicted to conflict and what is keeping that relationship alive is adrenaline and the addiction to adrenaline. Another way it shows up is numbness. In conscious loving, you have to feel alive. So in order to sustain unconscious loving, you numb yourself. And this can look like drugs, alcohol. It could look like the inner critic inside of us. This one was pre prevalent for me. It's like, there's this person inside of me that's criticizing everything I say, trying to guess what other people are saying, editing my life and trying to control other people. And when I do that or engage in that dialogue, I'm cutting myself off from my body and my feelings. Wow. Thusly, no intimacy in relationship. Well, wow. yeah. And that so, own worst critic in the head is a, is a very tough one mm -hmm. that I think we all deal with a lot. Right. 
Another one that comes up is illness or accidents. So uh, let's say you get in a fight with your partner and emotionally you can't handle it, you'll develop an illness or you'll get in a motorcycle accident. And that is another way to be inside of unconscious loving. Mm -hmm. So if these patterns are relating to in any way, like that's a great place to start in <laughs> answering your question of how do you choose or like be in relationship that's the first thing that, that I would say. And a good example I think we can give is when my shadow emerged with Alan <laughs> and um, I was so mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> I we, know what moment you're talking uh, about. Oh, I love it. I was, I, we were living together. I had so much, again, anger inside of me that I had decided to point at him because of a situation. And which was a ridiculous situation. I'm even embarrassed to say it. Yeah, you don't need to. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and my shadow emerges and then we entered into a power struggle. Mm. But we came out of it um, because uh, we had a willingness to be vulnerable and to not let that power struggle overtake yeah. our relationship and used it to actually get closer. I think it was oh, yeah. with that incident that I was like, this is what that triggered in me. Oh yeah. And no that's it oh okay um so a lot of this is like quite philosophical mm -hmm. right so to kind of bring it a little bit back down to like practicality here yeah. let's say that you're someone who has been in a relationship there was some type of trauma there was some type of ending of the relationship that was negative in your mind or negative to you emotionally and now all of a sudden you have somewhat of like a barrier to entering new relationships to allowing new people into your life i'm sure that you guys have been in relationships yep. like that or met people that are in that situation how do you kind of like start opening up that barrier to allow people into your life again when you're afraid to be vulnerable when you're afraid to be hurt again is there any practical step by step for that besides the philosophy itself of understanding that relationships are really the key to showing us what we need to change or what we need to work on Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to answer a, a couple of questions also that you didn't um, allude to, but it's the first step to everything, not just relationships. Like it starts with you. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to think of a, a good way to articulate this, but autonomy is necessary for closeness. Autonomy skills are, are exactly what you need. That's true independence. Because if I can't stand alone, I cannot stand in true partnership. And that fosters dependency. Autonomy meaning self-reliance. Self, I mean, so. like, just independence. Yeah, self-reliance. Not I, needing that person yeah. for your well-being or your life. Exactly. Right? So yeah. when I say codependency, I mean... I'm defining it as I, my reaction is entirely reliant on you. Mm. Like my happiness is reliant on you. Mm. The way I participate in life is, per, is on you. Mm. But true independence is, is not even being on your own. It's I can be fully on my own and I can be fully in closeness. And here's why that's important. Because if you are in codependency, you are not agreeing to be fully yourself. You are both deciding to be half of a person, which leaves you with less. If you multiply one half by one half you get like 0.25 you have less than what you started with and so to answer your question and circle back to that mm. you need to become a full person mm. and the best way to do that the best way at least i found in my life to even deal with trauma is in self-love and i know that sounds antiquated and mm. is actually not even a roadmap it's a destination sure. so i'm even happy to like back that up a little bit even more like yeah. how does that start how do you find self-love because when i say self-love i do not mean self-care i don't mean go take a bubble bath <laughs> like that's important <laughs> too but you're not going to change any core beliefs if you yeah. are just yeah going to a salon and taking bubble baths that might be a good place for us to go into because i would say if there's there's a lot of really unique parts about you. And I think one of the things that I, I most cherish about you is your ability to love yourself extremely well. And then that state also transfers to people around you. And you're, you're really good at helping people love themselves exactly where they totally. are. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things that I've seen in the lack of like vulnerability in relationships oftentimes is um, 
people are scared to get in a relationship because they're like, I'm not good enough yet. I'm not this yet. So how do you still love yourself, become, try and become that complete person, but then also realize that we're always a work in progress. There's no destination. You can't wait until you're in shape enough to get a girlfriend. You can't wait until you're, um, you know, you're whatever enough for that partner if you want to create that close relationship or multiple partners, whatever someone chooses. But um, I think that's important. That starts with self-love. So where's that balance? Um, how do how do you love yourself? Aww. I'm a huge <laughs> fan. Okay. <laughs> um, first, I want to comment on the the last statement you made, um, which I just want to totally debunk. When people are like, oh, "You can't be in a relationship until you learn to love yourself," which is basically saying you are not lovable yet, and I totally do not yeah. agree with that yeah. at all. Like, you are exactly as you are right now. Let's say you are not practicing self love, you are still worthy of love. Like, full stop. Mm. The end. So, goodbye. <laughs> and <Ciao>. peace. <laughs> Be with you. <laughs> and so, um, I don't know, like, the roadmap to self-love, but I can talk about mine. And how you internally react to this statement is going to be very indicative of where you are in your journey. And it'll be great because you'll figure out, like, where you need to, to start. And so, the first thing I will say is no one has ever abused you or judged you more than you have yourself. Yes. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. Ow. Agreed. Be yeah. And because you will accept the level of abuse and only to that level that you give yourself from other people. And so if that's something that's hitting you, it's like, are you kidding me, Brittany? This person did this to me, I didn't deserve it, la la la, you're, you're right, you didn't deserve it, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that your first step is to take full accountability of your life and full ownership of your life, and that'll be the place that you start on your journey. If you're ready to move on from that place and that statement resonated with you and you're like, yes, I'm ready to take ownership of my life and enter into the next phase of self-love, the next is uh, realizing that self-love is the polar opposite of self-abuse. And self-abuse, at least for me... Can, can, I, can I stop you on the first point? Yes. Um, as you say that, I think it's, it's really pertinent for you to say that because you've also been through um, your sexual debut, which was a gang rape. And how do you take accountability for that situation? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there's a super fine line here because there's a lot of people that are almost on the opposite end of the spectrum where mm -hmm. they're like taking almost too much accountability, blaming themselves. Yep. And so I'm not saying swing that pendulum over to that side. Like you are not to blame. Yeah, there is. That's it's not about who is to blame here. It's about taking responsibility for your life. And so I can recognize that. The amount of abuse I suffered was because that's what I thought I was worthy of. Wow. Yeah. So what I'm kind of hearing between the lines is it's not so much like the blame of who caused the trauma or the situation, but it's what you allow the meaning to be for you is the level of abuse and level of effect that it has on your life. There is that, yeah. And we teach people how to treat us by what we allow by what we encourage, by what we don't stop, I guess, in our, in our lives on yeah. a, a daily basis. And this is like a very subconscious level thing. It's not like, oh, I encouraged it. It's, it's not about that at all. I didn't encourage the trauma that came to me. And emotionally, like, I, I, was, I had an allowance for it. Physically, of course, like, that, that's not the case on this level this plane it wasn't like i could have stopped it i'm way bigger and stronger than these men that's not a reality yeah, <laughs> yeah. so i mean that's a, it's a tough swill to, pill to swallow and like some people are just not there yet and that's totally fine like there is no like right or wrong place to be in life it's just for me that is step one taking accountability for that yeah are yeah. you ready for step two yeah yeah Let's yeah. Step number two. <laughs> uh, people probably have a variety of self-abuse that they 
they encounter. For me, it was self-abuse coming from self-rejection, which stemmed from this perfect version of who I thought I should be. Mm. So the next step is, for me was just letting go of that. If there's no like, there's this perfect person I'm constantly comparing myself to of who I need to be. If there is that, I'm constantly rejecting myself and then I'm abusing myself. And that is a spiral downwards. And so getting getting rid of that is is definitely the next step for, for me, it was at least. And so that, that feels like it's self-acceptance there. Yeah. Like I'm great as I am. Is that what's that frame? I, I have a, uh, a great example of that for you, actually. Um, we, went, we went on like a, a hike one day and I had my videographer with me and I had yep. said to the group, I said, if anyone's, you know, uncomfortable being on camera or the fact that he's following us around or anything like that, um, just let me know and I'll make sure that you're, you know, whatever. And uh, one of our friends said, no, it's fine. I just, anything that you're going to put online, I'd like to approve it first. I'd like to see myself and approve it. And I said, that's totally cool. I, I, I agree with that. Um, and then I said, what about you, Brittany? And she goes, I know what I look like. You can put whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, yeah. it, and it was like, so many people are afraid to be on camera yeah. to share themselves with the world. And then it's like, when you really accept yourself, you're not trying to be perfect. You're not trying to be this image and you really truly do accept yourself. Then I'm sure you're just capturing who I am and I'm totally cool with that. It yeah. doesn't really matter. Yeah. And I think that's a good example of what you're talking about. It's like full acceptance and how you actually live what you're speaking and what you're preaching. Thank so, you for saying that. Yeah. Some people get caught in that too because it's personal development is very important, right? So we're always wanting to be better, but how do we accept ourselves at the same time as we're wanting to be better? And a frame that I heard from someone before is you are perfect, only becoming more perfect. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a very cool way of looking at it, right? You are already there, but you're becoming more there every day. You're working to be better every day. And it's let me accept where I am and continue to want to be better. That's helped me a lot. Yeah. I saw a meme or something similar. It was like, you are simultaneously a masterpiece and a work in progress. And I think that, that articulates it really well. And when I, I guess a, a big like tangible takeaway here and how to use that in your life is we have a limited amount of energy, a limited amount of personal power. And every day when you wake up, if you're using that energy and that personal power to mask who you are, that is a resource that could be used for creative projects, could be used for self-expression, could be used for a myriad of other things. So if you're going to bed at night feeling powerless during the day, you have given away your power probably to creating and maintaining self-limiting beliefs that are not concurrent with who you are. Mm. And so that takes away from also that personal development. So you can't even invest in personal development until you accept yourself exactly as you are. Now, let me challenge that because I'm sure a lot of people have felt this way. I have for sure. Is like, I want to think of myself like a masterpiece, but I'm not the person that I want to be. I'm not this. I'm not that. So what do you want me to do? Just pretend that I am or how do I accept myself for who I am? It's about not, it's okay to have a end game of who you want to be. And that is probably going to continue forever. What I'm saying is who you are today. Sure. Maybe you don't have to fully even accept it. Like, what does that even mean? It's like, Oh, I'm good with it. We're good. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying you don't use your energy. You don't use your resources. You don't use your personal power to try and mask it. You just embrace exactly who you are. Mm -hmm. Stop trying to hide it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Got it. And then you will actually be years ahead of your personal growth because awesome. that energy can be used to developing that person you want to be. So the paradigm shift is not like pretending that you are who you want to be. It's just being okay with where you're at right now yeah. and the fact that you're on the process to become that person. Exactly. Dope. Love that. Is there a step three or four? I think uh, <laughs> in terms of like just the basics of where to start, that yeah. is that is it. And then once you love yourself, I think that just like the love language and how you love other people, the way that you love yourself is going to be very different from person to person, figuring out what that is and then just practicing it in your, in your daily life. I like to kiss extremities if they're next to me. Like, oh, there's my arm randomly. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how do you guys it. love yourself 
Hmm. Oh man. <laughs> I, I'd say the biggest when like when I really feel that I love myself, a lot of times comes from like my gratitude process. Like just kind of like putting my focus on the different parts of my body in my mind and just being like, wow, like thank you to each of these different cells in my body that are just maintaining this life, maintaining how I feel every day, my stomach for digesting, my heart for beating, like all of that, and just getting in touch and kind of showing them some appreciation, these different cells inside my body. That usually feels pretty good. It's awesome. How about you? David Goggins talks about this thing called, this concept called the cookie jar. He's famous for doing like incredibly tough things, like running a hundred mile race and not being prepared for it. And, and one of the things that's gotten, gotten him through a lot of that is by diving into the cookie jar. And really what the cookie jar for him is talk about and look at the stories of the incredible things that you've done and be proud of yourself for who the triumphs you've come through, who you've become, um, the way you look at the world, the, the care you have and the intention you have. And I think for me, what always helps is like, what is my intention in this? I make mistakes all the time for sure. But what is my intention when I'm working to do that thing? Because oftentimes when we make a mistake, it's like, ah, you idiot, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. But it's like, what were you trying to do? Okay, you messed up. That's all good. And and a view that's helped me, and it really helped me because my first ayahuasca experience, a lot of it was seeing myself as a kid, is really realizing that I'm still a kid. And how would I treat my five-year-old nephew if he made a mistake? Would I be like, terrible you did horrible there yeah. or or would i be like hey it's all good come over here You're, it's fine and so i think compassion is a way that i'm learning to show love for myself love that so i think one thing that might be good for us to do is get more into some of the specifics of advice for women i think you really excel in that and and your take on both masculine and feminine energy is really powerful and so i want to make sure we we get more of that out of you in this episode as um as some value what are your thoughts yeah so when i was thinking about it before the show i was like you know something that i've experienced a lot with women in my life is a lot of them will approach attracting men from a position of like I need to show my beauty. I need to show my skin. I need to show different things. And I think that attracts men for sure in a certain way. But something that I've learned from you is that there's different types of attraction. And then there's different desires that women have, whether it's sexual desires or actually intimacy desires, things like that. So where does that line get drawn and how do you kind of look at it? Because I know you've said that there's really a big difference in how you attract people and how you put yourself out there and what you get back. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I'm very glad you asked that question because this is something that when I discovered, probably the most powerful I've felt. Like, oh, I felt like I had cracked a code or like I had a secret key into getting what I want, which I mean... I almost said getting what I want and felt bad about it, but <laughs> and then I was like, why did I feel that way? And that's, I think, something that people experience. We're so, like, afraid of what we want. So, something I'm still working on. <laughs> sure. And I would like to just, like, point out that exactly what you said. There are two different types of attraction uh, when it comes to men. And I'm glad you're both here because I'd love your perspective like perspective on this and the mistake that women make is we learn so much on the first type of attraction which is physical attraction but we expect to get out of it things that it just doesn't give you so if let's say I want a relationship or I want someone to text me back or call me or give me attention or Mm -hmm. protect me or provide for me or or cuddle with me like the first type of attraction, physical attraction, isn't actually going to get you that or make a man want to give you that. And when a man is physically attracted to a woman, they, and they use that term, like, I'm physically attracted to her. They yep. want to have sex with you. Yep. That's it. The end. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> Has anyone ever experienced that? <laughs> 
Yeah, so if you're wondering why, like, oh, I can get men to have sex with me, but I can't get them to call me back, or in the relationship, uh, it starts spiraling or changing, or once they catch me, everything changes. Men just like the chase. Mm. Mm, yeah, I Definitely know. like the chase. Yeah. Men just like the chase. <laughs> Yeah, and so I think that's like a, a problem that like women have and that I was having almost the exact opposite problem though. I was like, all these men want to like do stuff for me and I just want to have sex with them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so well, I'll, I'll start with the but, first. But the reason for that is really interesting. Yes, I'll yeah. start with the first type of attraction. So lots of studies on what makes you physically attracted to someone and i'll speak specifically for men being attracted to women or someone with a masculine essence being attracted to someone with a more feminine essence um just because it doesn't have to be gender related or sex related uh so the first one is shiny hair which is so funny but like there's so much products in the market about shiny hair and that just comes from uh, a man needing to know if he should give his resources to attracting a woman. If you have enough fat on your body, at least 17%, you will continue to ovulate. And if you don't, your hair won't be shiny at all. It'll be very dry and you'll stop ovulating. And that's nature's way to mm -hmm. make sure you don't get pregnant because you cannot carry a baby to term if you don't have enough fat on your body. Pause. So that's basically, they did a study yeah. to see what men react to and what they're attracted to. It's not like we're like, oh, she looks like she had about 14, 17, 16%. Exactly. Like that, enough. It's something <laughs> subconscious that comes up. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So shiny hair. Um, the second one is shapely body. And I want to point out here that, oh, and actually questions for you guys. Uh, <laughs> this is different for every man. Like every man, one of my favorite questions to ask is like, what's your favorite curve on a woman's body? Because mm. for everyone it's different. And yet women have this very good idea about what the perfect body looks like and think it's the same for every man and spends billions and billions of dollars trying to attain that. But to me, that's just ridiculous. Even if you attain it, it's hard to ma maintain. And yeah. so it's just like, if you are as you are, someone out there is digging you. Someone out there wants to bang you, I promise. <laughs> Let's go. So I'd love to ask you guys, like, tell me about the, the shapes in a woman body that, that really get you going. Uh, I'll let you start, Alan. Oh, I'll go. <laughs> Let's go. I like this. Um, well, I, the classic thing is people say I'm either more of like a, a tit or an ass man. Um, I'm definitely more of like a a ass person i like the athletic lower body um but for me i think one thing i also find really attractive is like a girl's arms um and i don't know i i'm also it's cliche to say but i'm I, it's like so much for me right now is about like the energy i feel but if we're just talking the look i would say like um an athletic lower body is very attractive to me Thank mm. you for sharing. Yeah. So to contrast, yeah, uh, <laughs> um, I'm definitely more of a boobs guy for yeah. sure. Um, but I'm going through the same thing. Like in my younger life, that was so important. And now in my life, it's much more about how I feel around a girl. And I think that's kind of what you're about to touch on is that like, yeah, physical attraction is super important. It's a way to get attention, but it's definitely not a way to maintain anything sure. after that. For sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for sharing. Yeah. For me, it's collarbones. I'm really into them. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to pause there for one moment because I want to say that there's like four things that will make a man physically attracted to you. And the first two are physical and the other two aren't even physical either. The second is sensuality. If you can tap into pleasure, like eating, or how do you like reach for a cup? If a man can see you and is like, oh, that girl experiences pleasure, he'll want to pleasure you. Mm. Ah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you just open yourself up to sensuality. Let your senses take you to places of extreme pleasure. And the last one is just sexual energy. And I want to point out here, if that's something that like you think that you're, you're missing and sexual energy, I'm really just talking about polarity and surrendering into your feminine. One, this is life juice. This is the nectar of the gods. This is everything. And the number one way to get it is sleeping. <laughs> 
Like you can be masculine on sugar and caffeine and no sleep and you can push through. Try being feminine on that. It is impossible. So Whoa. just start sleeping. Start getting pleasure in your everyday things. Stop caring about what your body looks like because someone loves it loves you exactly as you are and i mean just be healthy of course yeah mm -hmm. and then uh, make sure you're getting some fat so your hair's shiny like <laughs> that's it you want someone to sleep with you there it is but don't expect anything more than that they will penetrate you maybe really well too maybe they'll give you full body <laughs> orgasms that last for days maybe they'll open you up emotionally and enter your cervix zone and it's not painful and you have transcended experiences excellent they might not call you back <laughs> <laughs> why not why not okay so the second type of attraction is what makes a man feel compelled to give to you to spend time with you there's this innate desire inside of men to provide for women and so I find that so beautiful. Men are so endearing. Oh my God. Like if there's one thing you can take away from this and if you have the mindset of like, oh, men are the worst, like they're insensitive, la la la, compared to what? You're comparing them to a woman. You're not even comparing them to a woman. You're comparing them to your perfect idea of what a woman is. Compared to an alligator, they're not insensitive. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but if you can recognize like and celebrate the differences between men, you will start seeing them as the most endearing, the most giving, so loving and so caring. So if that's what you're looking for from a man, you don't even really need to worry about the physical attraction. Here's what you can worry about. <laughs> um, Okay, so the first thing is self-confidence. The number one most sexy thing that will make a man want to provide for you is self-confidence. Agreed. 100%. All right, there, there you have it. <laughs> self-confidence because they want to be your hero, but not for someone that's always a damsel in distress. Hmm. If you can provide for yourself, then they will feel so much more appreciation and more powerful by being able to provide to someone who is okay on their own. So if you're self-confident, they'll want to contribute to you and to your life. The second thing is authenticity, being very true to who you are. And in the last episode, we talked a little bit about how one of the hardest things for a woman to find is herself. She can find anything else. You lost the keys somewhere, she knows where they are. <laughs> That's like the hunter-gatherer mindset. We can find anything except usually ourselves because we are the adapters of the species. And that is a powerful thing. Like we can adapt to anything external. Once we know what someone needs from us, we can give it to them. And, and so once you find yourself and why it's so, it's so rare, and once you have that, men are also more inclined to love you. How can they love you if they can't find you? Well, wow. Yeah. The third one is passion. And it doesn't matter at all what you're passionate about. It could be reading. It could be napping. But the way that you light up when you talk about what you're passionate about, I don't know, really does something to men. What does it do to you guys? Like yeah. if there's a woman who's just lit... What is that like? What is that experience like for you? Well, you're seeing you're seeing her true essence. I think you're seeing her express herself and that's beautiful. It's like one of the things I've you notice if you go to like a bar and there's a musician playing and he gets like or she gets so into it and they just go all in. Everyone just just cheering and can't help but really be in that moment cuz you're seeing someone fully feel themselves. That's attractive to a really deep level and so yeah i think i think that one especially goes across the sexes for guys and girls um seeing someone that really really feels something is beautiful yeah i think the best way to put it is like it's contagious yeah and it's inspiring well that wow and we all want to feel that and so when someone else feels it and we can feel it by being around them we just want to be around them <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Ah, and I want to give a quick gift to you guys and any man listening. Uh, women can light up when they're passionate. They also light up when they're around you. And I, I want you to know that that is not like 
what they naturally are, they are lit up because of you. And mm-hmm. if you're bringing that out in a woman, huh, she's hooked. <laughs> 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 and, and the last one, which is, I think, the hardest for women, is being receptive. And, and that's tough because our, our culture doesn't really allow for that. It's, it's seen as being in total opposition to independence. Uh, but if a man tries to give to you and you don't receive it, he's going to stop trying to give to you. <laughs> yeah. And so if you're receptive to who he is, who he wants to be, and the gifts that he's giving to you, he will continue to want to give you those gifts. Mm. So you are usually these four things at the beginning of a relationship. And then it starts going sour. What happened there? Can I talk about the receptive one real quick? Yes. I, I have a I have a good story for that. Um, that is a big turnoff for me. One of the things that I love is adventure, and I love to have a partner next to me who wants to do adventurous things. And I remember I've had this happen with a few different girls, but um, one instance in particular with someone I was dating, I wanted to go out into the ocean. We were in the Caribbean, and it was nighttime. And I'm like, let's go swim in the ocean. Let's go ride waves. Like, come with me. And they're like... I don't want to. I'm scared. I don't want to. I, I, I'm not. And, and like for me, I'm like, it felt like it was like this gift I wanted to give her. I wanted to have this incredible experience under the stars. It's pitch dark in the Caribbean ocean, swimming in the waves. And she couldn't, she didn't even want to let me give that gift to her. She wasn't trusting enough for it. And I remember that being a moment where it was like, I, that's really important to me to have a partner who can receive that and trust to go do something like that. Um, and, and I'll tell you one of the biggest turnoffs for me that's, that kind of can exist in a relationship. Yeah. And, and that goes into like the, just the flow of value in like the universe. Whenever you like don't receive something, when someone tries to give you something, you say, no, no, no I don't, you know, like even if someone wants to buy you lunch, wants to do something and yep. you say, no, no, no I'm going to pay for it. You're like, no, no, I insist. No, 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 I'm not going to accept that. Yep. You're stopping the flow of value in yep. the world. And I think women do that because, okay, at least this is what I did. It was hard to receive because I didn't see my own value. Like, mm. if a man feels that way about you and is feeling very charmed and enchanted and wants to give to you because you've shown the first, second type of attraction, they are thinking all of the time about how to contribute to your life. They're spending resources, brain space, trying to think of like, how can I make her life better? And what they really just need from you, like being around a contented woman is everything. Mm. There was another study I was reading about the sound of a woman's voice, a happy woman's voice in a man's mind shows up exactly where music shows up. Where if as a woman is complaining, which we do because we're externally motivated. And it's, if I'm a woman talking to another woman and I complain about something, she'll never do it again. And then we expect the same thing from men. We complain about something, they're not gonna change. They have a different entire set of who they are and what they respond to. Yeah. <laughs> and so a woman that's complaining, they'll just be like, I'm out of here. <laughs> but if you are just a contented woman and being around you is enough to give a man energy. So recognize your value in that. And it can feel frustrating maybe sometimes. Like let's say you're in a relationship with someone and he is just playing a video game and you're in the same room and you're like, I'm here to spend time with you. He doesn't need anything else from you. Like being in the same room with you is enough. And I think that's very powerful because when you say recognizing the flow of value, one of the things that stops the value is we don't see our value. We don't see how it's contributing to your lives. Mm, that's huge. Mm, yeah. It's almost like you don't want to be a, a nuisance or something. I, I, feel, I feel sometimes when, when I'm trying to give to girls, it's like, I don't, want to, I don't want to have you do that. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to have you be, have to do that. Like, it's yeah. an inconvenience rather than something that we want to do. Yeah. yeah. And, and on our side, we're like, no, I want, like, yeah. it's going to make me feel good to do that. Yeah. And you're stopping me from being able to do that. Um, I want to I want to dig a little bit like deeper and more practical into this in terms of like it's not one way or another or another it's not like okay you shouldn't try to look beautiful you shouldn't try to you know make yourself the best you know physically attractive person as possible and then you should just focus on like being these four other things where's the balance between those two and where are people kind of going wrong 
There is no right or wrong answer because your desires are different. If all I want from someone is to have sex with them, I'll focus on the first level of attraction. If I want a deep emotional friendship with someone, it would be the second. And I haven't figured out how to marry marry them, so I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> I mean, I know that you can, um, but also for women, I just... Oh, I, I really want you to see how special a man's friendship is and how you cannot get enough of them. And that's something that should never be uh, diminished, I guess. It's not like, oh, men only have relationships, like monogamous sexual relationships to give to me and dating relationships. A man's friendship is very powerful and being here and having your guys's friendship and our friend group's friendship has put me in a place of extreme abundance and you yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when it comes to like men in my life in the sexual capacity i'm just like my standard just keeps raising because i'm around such amazing men who do all of those things for me they text me back they cuddle with me <laughs> they spend time with me they contribute to my life they are such like a life force to me you guys are amazing thank you <laughs> thank you Our wow pleasure. thank you for the honey roast i like it Whew. totally um sort of to kind of flip sides right like this was really all about women understanding this let's give some insight for guys about like what are the best ways to be attractive to women what are women really looking for how does it feel to be a woman in the opposite side. Any any notes on that? Because <laughs> <laughs> oh. so to kind of kind of help you out, um, one of the things that you've taught us is like when women are in a situation, it's like the whole environment is coming at you, so to say, like ah, oh, this needs to be moved. This is not straight. This is kind of you know, and, and the diffuse attention essentially. And one thing that you've taught me is like. If you notice that a girl has diffuse attention and she's nervous or she's feeling a certain way, the best thing to do is just like touch her and, and make some strong eye contact and just bring her in and kind of bring that awareness into you know one place. What are some other things like that? And do you want to elaborate on the power of that? Because I've definitely seen it firsthand. Yeah, that is everything. So for some contrast, if you're a man and listening, you're like, I have single focused. I get frustrated. <laughs> I'm a woman, I have diffused awareness, I get overwhelmed. <laughs> like that's probably mm. the best uh, the comparison there. And so when we're talking about diffused awareness, it's not like, oh, so you focus on two things. No, you focus on three things. It's like, no, zero focus. <laughs> <laughs> it's just awareness of everything going on. And which is why we can find the keys when they're lost, <laughs> which is why we can, it's a source of a potent power, like uh, women, have an awareness of what's going on externally men are drived internally that's why like your entire life is an unfolding of who you are yep. women don't experience that at least if they're like in their feminine and so I, that's a, a huge thing like if a woman craves consciousness like just deep pure consciousness and presence and if you can give that to her if you can do that through that touch through that strong eye contact and just be a depthful well of consciousness a riverbed she can flow through that unencumbered i think that feminine energy is powerful it's like the entire ocean it's every wave it's the salty air it's the water it's the life inside and the conscious man is the ship on the ocean it has direction <laughs> mm. and so if you, a woman like fully surrendering into her feminine has no direction just like in full surrender and full flow and what do you do with that like you can't really function without direction <laughs> yeah. and so in order to like surrender to you fully if you have that consciousness and you have that direction then she will and I actually one of the things you mentioned that I want to bring up again because I think I don't want it to be missed and it was really important is you saying like something about you wanted her to trust you yeah okay dear sweet women <laughs> <laughs> women are like Okay, in the wild, we're like, okay, this man's the biggest and the strongest. He's going to protect me from a tiger. He can feed my family. He is the leader of the pack. So if he dies, the rest of the pack is going to contribute to me. This is the safest bet. He does one thing wrong, 
It's like, all right, which is the next safest bet on to the next where men crave, like, I want you to be on my side. I want you to stand by me in right or wrong. I want you to trust me. So one way to get that from a woman is that consciousness. And women know that like it's that cave woman inside of you that's like, hmm, I don't trust you. I'm moving on to the next. And just if you actually care about this man you're with, put that aside and stay, stay by him, have his back. That's it. A lot of women that I talk to are like, yeah, I'll trust him as long as he makes the right decisions. <laughs> 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 but if you're looking for a lifetime of full relationship with a man, trust is, is necessary. I'd love to hear how that's been, I guess, for you guys. Like, is that true? Am I just making stuff up? Um, I would say one of the biggest contributors to like me having long-term attraction for a girl is the way that she views me in her eyes. And I yep. think that really has a lot to do with what you're saying, where it's like, I know that through this journey of life, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to fuck shit up. It, there's going to be like, there's going to be good. There's going to be bad. And when I have a, a woman in my life, who's like, Hey, no matter what you do, you're still a hero in my eyes. Yeah. That breeds that confidence within me to go out there and fight, to go out there and continue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're saying. <laughs> That's so beautiful. <laughs> oh my God. Love that. That's awesome, man. Very powerful. I, I, I feel the exact same way. I think um, the way, as a guy, you know the way the woman you're with views you. And if that's a, a view of trust, of confidence, of um, like pride that I'm with this person as well, like, like this is my man. And I'm like, I'm... I'm dedicated. I'm, I'm going to fight by this dude's side. It, it gives you this different life force. It gives you this different power to really, um, to really excel greater than I think we would. Hmm. So going back to subtle advice for men, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, something that I found powerful and I'd love to hear the female perspective on this is when I meet a girl who to me is like different, to me is special to me is not like every other girl that I've dated there's like this thing where you're like okay well I don't want to I don't want to show too much interest I don't want to be like overbearing and showing my attraction but I also want to make sure that she knows how special she is and that she's just not another girl in my rolodex of girls so to say right let's just say yep. so how do you kind of balance that because I've seen the power of making a girl feel special and being honest about that, but then I've also seen the power of like being overbearing and then she's like, ah, it's too fast, too quick. You know what I'm saying? So what is that like on the other side? Well, for me, <laughs> I like, I don't have a balance. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm all in, <laughs> yeah. but I, it doesn't have to be overbearing. Um, it's, it's just honesty. It's bearing the truth of who you are and how you feel. And if you don't want it to be misinterpreted, then you just have to be more honest and more communicative. Like, you are very special to me. Don't know where this is going, but I'm really excited to be on the ride. Great. Hmm. Yeah, I have some comments about that too, I think. <laughs> I think one, one of the things, maybe when I, I feel like I was younger, I was a lot like, can't, can't show too much interest, but I, I feel like now stepping into a different power it's like if there's a girl i want i'm like i want you it's not from a place of need there's mm -hmm. a difference between i need you and i want you i want you i see the amazing woman you are i see all the qualities you have the confidence uh you're sexy you're fun you're all these things and it's like i want you and she can feel that and i'm it's even at a place where it's like i don't give a fuck if you don't right like even if you say no okay that's cool but i'm like congruent this is this is what i want and i think if we can step into that as guys not need but want it, there's power behind that and girls feel that and and tend to like it yeah, and it kind of goes to what type of woman do you want like do you want someone that would respond in fear to that probably not if you're looking for <laughs> extreme closeness <laughs> and to true. use relationship as a source of growth very cool yeah that makes a lot of sense so the answer really is just digging deep and being bold enough to be really honest yeah be bold be brave yep. live fully participate in your life 
there are a lot of women, when they see that boldness, it does scare them because they're too used to playing the game. And so I, I think as a guy, we've been conditioned a lot to like, show where you're interested, but you know, wait a little bit, keep, keep the gas on. And, and I think it's also like you're saying, it's a good indicator of where she's at. Mm. And it's like, I'm bold. I want you, I'm going for you. And then, and then it's like, if she's like, oh, this is too much. This is, he's coming on too strong. I often find that it's with like younger women. They're like, oh, he's not playing the game. Oh, I don't value him. Mm. They're not actually seeing you for your value. They're, they're perceiving your value based upon how much you like them or not. Mm. Um, which I think is an unhealthy behavior. Mm. Totally. So kind of shifting a little bit, you mentioned earlier like how important your friendships with men are. Um, obviously, all of our friendships are incredibly valuable to all of us. Um, you're really good at cultivating those. And a conversation that we've had is like, none of us have ever had to have the conversation of like, Brittany, you're in the friend zone or James, you're in the friend zone. It just kind of like naturally evolved into that. Um, what is it that you'd say for someone that like is a woman who wants to cultivate more male friendships in her life? Number one, how does she filter for the right men? And then how does she attract the right men? Yeah. So you're essentially asking to make sure I understand it correctly, how to bring out the best in men. There's this. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. There's this, uh, Alison Armstrong has this like story about how um, like, she was at a conference and this woman stands up and she was like, men start out so great and then once they catch me, they just go terrible. What's happening there? And the guy was like, oh, you're a frog farmer. And she was like, what? <laughs> and the guy says, some women are queens and they turn men into princes. Some women are frog farmers and they turn Princes. princes into frogs <laughs> and so the first like advice there is just consider for one moment that maybe a man is reacting to you we're often like interacting with just people in the day and we're like that person was rude to me it's a rude person but because we come from such different places we're not recognizing that they have different motivations different programming and once you understand those differences, then you can bring out the best in men. And so like, that's where I am. I'm just trying to learn and celebrate your gender because I am intrigued and I love it. Men are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually don't know, like I know we've never had that conversation, but I also know I've, I mean, I don't, none of us have ever like tried to, to cultivate anything different. So it was, what is, it was just me trying, not trying, just being confident, being authentic, being passionate and being receptive. And you guys responded to that in a way that demonstrated your growth and where you are in your life. And it was a great connection, some immediately, some over time. <laughs> <laughs> True. And then that just, it fostered. And then at that point, it's a spiral up or it's a spiral down. And most people are used to this spiral down where like, let's say a man does something that makes a woman mad. And I'm sure we've all familiar <laughs> with that. Like he, I don't know, what's something that you guys have done that just pissed off a woman and you were like, where did that come from? Forgot to call them back. Okay, you forgot to call this girl back. And she's like, if I cared about someone, I would call them back. Therefore, he doesn't care about me. This is something men should know about women too, to answer your question. Mm. Our minds, our gatherer minds, are constantly going through every scenario, every thing that could possibly happen. And so we're like, he doesn't care about me. I wonder why. And going through all of the scenarios, but we always end up at the same one. Something is wrong with us. So mm -hmm. then we lose our confidence. When well, we lose our confidence, you don't want to contribute to us anymore. Once you stop contributing to us, we can't find us. We lose who we are. We use, lose that authenticity. And if you, we can't find us, you can't find us to love us. Once that happens, we can't give any time or energy to our passions or communicating them or cultivating them. And then we start becoming closed and unreceptive to your gifts and love. That is the spiral down and that's really just what is occurring. So it's at that point that shadow in the relationship where you choose conscious loving. And a good place to start is really just understanding what's going on uh, in the minds of the, the other gender because we are so different. So just being curious and asking questions like 
you guys to women too. Like, I'm just curious, why did you do that? Like men don't talk about that because it's so obvious to them why they did something. But I'll ask a man something like, wait a second, why did you do that? And they're like, well, it's obvious, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> and it's just like so far off from what I like thought about it all. Mm -hmm. And so back to like some concrete advice. Okay, <laughs> communication. We're gonna, we're gonna dive into that hole. If you're a, a woman, as you can see through this podcast, I could just monologue for days and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. <laughs> and, and there's a reason why we do that, um, which I can get into later. But when you ask a man a question, that single focus, he is a deep well. Let's say I ask you, Alan, why didn't you call me back? They will probably not answer right away. They'll go internal because they have a sense of self. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll go deep into that well and try to find the answer. But because women are just like, oh, this is the right answer. I know it because I've been externally motivated and I know what's going on in the environment around me and this is how I should respond. <laughs> we'll have an answer right away. And when a man doesn't have an answer right away, we do what a teacher does. We start giving them some, a different question. We rephrase it. And now mm -hmm. they have to start over. Start over trying to find the answer inside of them. Mm -hmm. And then when they don't answer right away, we do, again, what a teacher does. We give them a multiple choice. Was it because you lost my phone number? Was it because you're not interested anymore? Are you trying to play a game with me? And usually the multiple choice answers we give are so far off from the truth that that breeds disconnection because now he's like, she doesn't understand me at all. <laughs> <laughs> so when you ask the question duct tape over your mouth. One of my favorite things to do is always when they stop talking, wait at least 30 seconds. Something else is going to come up because they're, they're digging inside of them to give you the truth of the answer and trust them. Like if someone says, if one of you were like, I'm busy Saturday, that does, there's no subcontext there. They're not, not interested. They're literally busy on Saturday. <laughs> There's not all these other hidden meanings behind yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's because that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And, and I've seen you literally like embrace that. Like I know that you do it. I do it. It's like I'll get a text message or a voice message or whatever. And I like I won't respond for a day or so. Yep. And like I do it to you once in a while. And I'm like I usually apologize after because I have so much respect for you. But you turn around and you're like I don't expect you to respond to me immediately. Like, I, yeah. I know you're super busy. I'm yeah. not taking it as a reflection of how much you care about me or how much you respect me. Yeah. Like, I get you. And that, being able to, like, feel okay with that, instead of me being like, cool, let me abuse it. Let me just not respond for two days now. It made me more timely. It made me more want to, like, oh, yeah. reciprocate because I'm like, she understands me. She's on the same wavelength. Yep. Yeah, rather than, hey, I'm going to be punished, right? Because then when you're punished, you're like, ugh. You avoid that energy. That's the disconnection you see. And that's the disconnection that's the because it's like, oh, you didn't do this. It's so, it's so funny. Uh, a girl I recently started talking with, she had texted me and I didn't respond for like a day and a half. And she sent me all these like, she sent me like kind of as a joke, like crying eyes. <laughs> and then I'm just like, it, it was a little drama, but it was just an indicator for me of like, actually, I, I don't like that, right? I like understanding. And as opposed to another girl that I've been talking with and she was like, oh, Totally cool. No, I, I get it. You're busy. I, you don't need to respond to me every day. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I like that. You get it. Yep. Totally. Yes. And on the flip side, <laughs> you guys still give me the allowance to, to be that. I'm like, you don't need to respond to me, but I am going to send you paragraphs of messages. And there's <laughs> going, I'm just going to be me conversing with myself in a stream. <laughs> and memes. <laughs> and memes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Love that. That's awesome. Yeah, it's so nice. Wow. So many cool topics we covered today. Yeah. Yeah, it's been super powerful and insightful. Thank you for being willing to share and come on a second time. Yeah, this it feels like a closing up, which I'm okay with. But also, I've just been talking about men. And you guys are actually men. And I don't know if I got <laughs> enough, like, commentary <laughs> of, like, supporting evidence. Yeah. Certainly, like... Anything that you guys want to like touch on or comment on between the, what was it at the beginning? The uh, attraction, like uh, the different things that you're attracted to mm. or inside of a relationship, conscious versus unconscious loving. Hmm. Yeah. Um, a couple things. When you were talking about just like being in 
in the opposite sex presence or a man being in a woman's presence you brought up something very simple but it was like the video game reference of like he's happy just having you be there while he plays video games like a moment for me that is always really powerful with a girl uh, is if I'm I like to watch UFC fights and I don't watch much sports but every once in a while like once every five weeks there's a fight on and I love being there with a girl that I care about and just watching the fights and cuddling I don't need conversation I don't need anything else and like it's interesting because some girls can like put up with that and then other girls are like okay I need like we need to do something I'm bored we need to go and it's like I just want to be in, in your presence and enjoy this moment so that's something kind of simple that you brought up that I definitely agree with. Hmm. Yeah, I, to kind of comment on that, like a lot of times it's just like refilling the feminine energy bucket, so to say, like that's really all we want. And that's one thing that kind of, I don't want to say bothers me, but kind of like aches me that so many women have this narrative and this is such a big thing, like penetrating through consciousness is like, men only want sex men only want sex and yeah, i'm just yeah. like that's so not true for so many men it's true for a lot of men i'm not going to say sure, that it's sure. rooted in nothing but it's like a lot of men just want closeness a lot of men just want to spend time with women a lot of men just want a female perspective a lot of men just want that and um, it has a lot to do with like we're saying like having friends of the opposite sex that you're not having sex with that you're not doing a lot of times those relationships are way more fulfilling and way more powerful because there's not that whole stigma of like, he wants to sleep with me, he doesn't, she wants to, blah, blah, blah that kind of stuff. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. And I think that's, that's a narrative that's been over portrayed. Um, oftentimes when people don't know how to get the closeness and the female energy out of just interaction and connection, the man thinks he needs to fill his feminine energy bucket just up with sex. And once you realize that you can actually fill it and overflow it just from being in the presence of an awesome woman, having great conversation, great connection, uh, it changes. It changes a lot. I love that you were gesturing to me when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Huge fan. Um, there was one thing that you guys both mentioned about how early in life you were really interested in boobs, ass. <laughs> yeah. And now it's kind of shifted. What, what made that shift happen for you guys? Um, I'd say the, I'd say being in the presence a lot of, of boobs and ass and realizing how shallow that is and realizing how like if there's not really much more depth to the person than like a girl's physical beauty, just, I, I'm just not going to be interested for very long. And it ends up like looking back, I go, I wasted a few weeks, like, yeah you know and, and I like I want to save my time I want to like spend time with people that like I'm physically attracted to but then have that whole other side of attraction too hmm. yeah I think you can really notice at least for me when it when a girl really relies on the physical beauty pillar too much um and and it's it's hard to see too because you're like hey you're you can see how great they are but they're so focused on I have to be the best looking I have to be and I've seen that kind of play out uh, both with female friends and also with with relationships where it's like I can only feel good if I know I'm the most beautiful girl in the room it's yeah. like there's always a more beautiful girl <laughs> and you're never gonna feel good it's a recipe for really disaster and um yeah you look like you want to say something about that so I'll stop <laughs> there <laughs> yes Oh, something else men should know about women. Mm. <laughs> I didn't answer that question immediately, but like some small gems keep coming out. Coming out yeah. <laughs> sure. Competition. Like, where does that come from? Women are so competitive with each other. And I want you to understand why. And something that you can do to make the women that you're with feel like she doesn't have to be that way. Yep. It all goes back to our, our physical self. And we're just smaller. We're weaker. And when we were living out in nature in survival mode... We needed men to protect us, and we hate it. <laughs> but we, inside, there's like this cave woman inside of us that just is like, oh, I need a man to protect me. And me, which means that if there's a tiger going to come into this room and attack us, I need to know you're going to protect me. There's going to be a lot of other people here you could protect, mm -hmm. but if I'm not 
the prettiest, not in the room, in the world, if I'm not the most entertaining, if I'm not the version of the perfect person, there's a chance you will choose to protect someone else. Mm. And here's why women believe that. Wow. Yeah. We believe that because we don't understand honor. And men are going to hear this and think it's like the biggest jab to women. (laughs) And women are like not going to give a shit. (laughs) We have no honor. (laughs) (laughs) And honor is so important and prevalent to men. Honor is I'm going to do the right thing regardless of how I feel about something. Mm. That is so incongruent to a woman because the right thing is how I feel about it. I'm never going to act in a different way to how I feel about something. Uh, And it's always changing. And it's always changing, yeah. Mm. And so therefore we have no honor. It's not to say we don't have integrity. We don't (laughs) have courage. Like we have a lot of awesome things, just honor is not among them. And so when, like, let's say we're in a fight or a, a woman is here, I'm just like, oh, I just alienated my protector. Shit, I need to make sure that he is okay again. So I'm going to try to like please you. So women are constantly like, one, undermining your power because it scares them. And then two, being like, oh, actually, I need you to protect me even though I hate it, which is why I just emasculated you by trying to take your power away. So now I'm going to try and please you. Like, ah, I roll my eyes at something you say. I'm trying to diminish an accomplishment you made and then i'm like but do you want a muffin (laughs) 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 that's what's going on Mm. it's like we're scared of your power and we think we need to take it away and then we're like oh this is my protector who i need to make sure is protecting me so i need to constantly make sure please don't abuse you guys won't anyone listening please don't abuse this with like the women in your life they are trying to please you because instinctively They need you to protect them. And Mm. yet simultaneously, they're afraid of that power. And so they're also trying to take it away, which is a different different cycle. That's kind of the basis of um, objectification. And I also think part of that taking away of the power or fighting it is also what we have talked about as shit tests. Mm -hmm. It's like, how how strong is my man really? Can he put up with this emotional thing and not abandon me as the tiger comes? And, and something, an analogy that both myself and Gary really like is um, oftentimes it seems like women can be the storm, the ocean, right? There, it's, it's this kind of, it can be at times chaos emotionally. And what guys think we need to do is we got to hop in the little rowboat that's on the ocean to get in that emotional state with her. And what I've learned over the years in relationships is actually we're the lighthouse. We have to stand there hear, give her that presence, give her that respect, give her that focus and attention, but be the lighthouse. It's all good. It's fine. Everything's going to be fine. I, I see that you're attacking me. I'm, I'm not going to stoop down and attack you as well. I'm going to be able to stand in that presence. And when you can do that for a woman, it's, uh, it is incredibly powerful. And, and what does that do to that cycle? So when you have a guy that doesn't react to your attempt to take his power, your attempt to do these different things, and he's non-reactive to that stuff, how does that create connection as opposed to disconnection? Which seems counterintuitive. And it is dependent on also, like, which state of unconscious loving they're a part of. Like, there is isn't a dichotomy to that, where if you are non-reactive, like, if she's trying to get a reaction from you, and that's, like, what she's trying to do, then it would actually have the opposite effect, mm-hmm. because she's like, I just need some something from you. I don't even care what it is. If it's just anger, fine. I'm going to try and get that. But that is, that's definitely not the case here. Like, you're, you're giving to women, and yeah. they're just, like, going through something maybe external, or maybe something you did that they don't understand, and they're going through, like, an emotional emotional state. All, all you have to do is is be fully present that's it that's it yeah it's not numb by not getting in the boat you're not numbing yourself to it it's it's i will be completely present to listen and hear and and let you express yourself but i'm not going to hop in and no you didn't you know i'm not going to hop in emotionally and fight it i'm just going to be there to be a part of it yeah and one i think that can be very difficult for men because you are natural problem solvers she's coming to you and she's like really upset about a problem and you're like i have an answer and she's like no (laughs) 
It's not what I that's want. That's not what I, I just. Gosh, this happened so many times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so cute. It, t- it took me a while to learn that. <laughs> yeah, she just like wants to be heard and like no solving of the problem necessary and just being fully present. And that is very unique to a woman. I don't know if it's something you experience, but it's really hard for us to be present and connected. And so if we're in conversation, I am so aware of everything that's going on around me Mm. and it's all talking to me. And if I'm just like, I'm not choosing to go turn off the stove instead of listen to you. Like I'm turning it off so I can be more present with you, but there's always something that could change to be more present. So if you need to have a conversation with a woman, take her to the quietest place in the house (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> or have her like close her eyes or something <laughs> that's so funny that that reminds me of um i was at lunch one day and we were sitting there and it was it was a couple and they were clearly like long-term couple they've been in a relationship for a while and the guy was sitting on his phone literally 90 percent of the meal had his phone out and they were barely even conversing and i'm sitting there with uh with kian actually and we're and we're sitting and we're just watching the dynamic and we're like this relationship is literally like self-destructing in front of us like you could literally see because of his lack of presence and you could see her just like you know like not being able to get his attention not having anything like that and kian actually went up at like at the end of the meal and went to the guy and went in his in his ear and was like dude put your fucking phone down and pay attention to the beautiful girl in front of you Wow. And he said that to her. Love that. And I was love like, King. yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, damn, like that probably was a catalyst for that relationship possibly going in a different direction. And the reason I bring that up is like a lesson that I learned from a book that I read was like transmuting love to someone is not necessarily like the five love languages or like buying them gifts or doing something or doing something physical for them or all that kind of stuff. Transmuting love is like being fully present with someone. And like when you've got your phone out, when you've got other things going on, when you're distracted or doing that, you're not really loving someone, even though you might want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Go keys. Go big keys. <laughs> good stuff. I think that might be a, uh, a good place for us to stop. Yeah. Good stuff, guys. I appreciate awesome. you being um, here. I, I want to say one more thing before we go. I think it's the day that this drops is going to be your meeting for your course that you have coming up. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to kind of, I know you said on the last ep- episode, but for those of you that didn't hear, um, Alan and I have been kind of encouraging Brittany to open up some space and to yeah. kind of create a space for her to share some of her knowledge and things we've been talking about. So can you tell us a little bit about what you got going on later today? Yeah, this is a, a great example. Look at, this is all just them contributing to my life. And I've been very receptive to it. And that's why I'm here. And I thank you. And I love you. <laughs> and so, yes, the day this drops is the the first meeting of our women's workshop that we're doing. And there's a link that you can click on to fill out a type form with your email. And I can send you all of the details. Yeah. yeah. We'll have it in the show notes below. Yeah. And the content is... Uh, A lot of things we talked about last time, feminine energy. It's about understanding and celebrating the differences between men and women. It's about relationships, how to cultivate conscious loving. It's about sex and how to use it to combine, to commune with the divine. And uh, it's about awakening. And then there's a panel of men to ask questions to towards the end. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So any women that are listening that found this interesting learn something from this episode i highly recommend that you dig into that um you're gonna go a lot deeper i'm sure during those six weeks so highly encourage that um other thing is if you guys are not already in our facebook group we have a facebook group face your freedom group it's uh just a bunch of like-minded people that enjoy our content that are also on similar journeys so if you want to connect with more people please do that we'll put a link as well in the notes and anything else on your side no awesome thank you for watching guys thank you Brittany. Uh, yeah thank you Brittany. appreciate you being here we'll see you guys next week